Even though the sun had long set over the verdant hills of Springfield, Oregon, Thursday, May 19, 1983, remained as warm at night as it had at noon. There was a quiet to the evening, the kind of languishing stillness that sometimes thresholds a storm. But the night staff at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital felt no oncoming torrent, and after so many years fighting unpredictable emergencies, they often found themselves with an innate power to feel something sinister in the air. And the professionals they were, they were always ready. Nothing had pre-armed them, however, for the drama that unfolded at their literal doorstep at approximately 10.48 p.m. No warning had come until the red late-model Nissan bearing Arizona license plates careened into the emergency drop-off, bleeding its horn to scare the devils from hell. The skeleton night shift all heard it. Their faces told them immediately that what they had anticipated a quiet night in the ER was not to be. Dr. John Mackey, the physician in charge, and the two nurses Rose Martin and Shelby Day felt the familiar adrenaline. Receptionist Judy Patterson rolled back her typewriter ledge and quickly forgot about the routine insurance form she had been updating. In the driveway just beyond the double automatic doors of the ER, a blonde woman in her twenties waved them on. She looked ashen in the fluorescent tube lighting, and she wildly pointed to the interior of her car. Somebody just shot my kids, was all she seemed to know how to say. Patterson, hearing the mother's words, did what she always did in emergencies involving violent crime. She dialed for the police. Nurses Martin and Day teetered when they looked through the windows of the Nissan. Side panels were soaked in blood, and amidst the blood lay three small children, one in the front passenger seat, two in the back. First glance told the nurses the children had been shot at very close range. A golden-haired child up front, a girl, couldn't have been any more than seven or eight, the RNs apprised. Of the two in the rear, one was a girl, maybe a trifle older than the other, and a boy, merely a toddler. This call was unexpected, and it was bad, very bad. Personnel from intensive care were summoned to assist ER, and a SWAT-like team of white coat professionals, including top surgeon Fred Wilhite, volleyed to the scene as the trio of injured youngsters were carried in by weeping nurses and pale interns. As reinforcement came, Dr. Mackey explained the situation to them in two taut words, chest wounds. Two of the children still breathed, although strenuously. The boy gasped for air. The child found slumped in the front seat appeared beyond help. Despite frantic efforts by the doctors at the operating table, the damage had been lethal. She was pronounced dead moments after being wheeled to emergency. Only later did the medics learn the children's names and ages Christy Downs, eight, Cheryl Ann Downs, seven, and Danny Downs, three, but names and ages didn't matter yet. In fact, they were the least important factor in this hour, this night, this calamity. What mattered is that someone without a heart had deliberately attempted to murder three kids in cold blood. And despite the odds, despite a fate that looked gloomy, the caretakers hastened to keep that fate at bay and beat it at its own game, with deliberate intention. Skilled hands attended to the two operable victims. Feeling the children succumbing to severe blood loss and lack of oxygen, they performed tracheotomies on them to free the flowing blood and salvage much-needed air. Machines began to pump the little hearts and revitalize the other organs. Despite the children's fragile condition, Mackey and his experts kept them alive. Miraculously. Author Anne Rule, who relates the tragedy in her excellent book Small Sacrifices, writes, One child was dead, Cheryl. One child, Christy, had defied the odds and lived through profound blood loss, heart stoppage, and delicate surgery. One child, Danny, seemed stable but was at risk of paralysis. Who in the name of God could have aimed a pistol at three small children and pulled the trigger? Their mother, Diane, didn't supply an answer. She told hospital receptionist Patterson that she and her family had been driving home from visiting a friend in nearby Marcola when a man, a bushy-haired stranger type, had waved down their car on a lonely span of highway. Thinking he needed help, Diane paused to inquire. And that was when, said a tearful Diane, the man pointed his gun through her car window and loosened its barrel on her three helpless offspring. Both Springfield and Lane County Police responded. To them, she exacted the tale of the ambush and an odd description of the vagabond. Reacting to the story, the departments issued an emergency watch on the city and county roads, 
fearing that there might be a madman roaming the outskirts of Springfield, its lanes and byways. Squads drew into action in the area described by Diane as the point of attack in the vicinity of Marcola and Old Mohawk Road. A desolate spot became the center of a manhunt. Since the crime was purported to have occurred in the county, members of the Sheriff's Office for Lane County became principal investigators. Sergeant Robin Rutherford was the county's first man to approach the children's mother at the hospital. When he arrived, the nurses were tending to her arm, which bore a series of small, superficial wounds marked between the elbow and the wrist from where she had tried to ward off the gunman's blows. Seeing that Mrs. Down's injuries were minor, and that she seemed to be in an unusual state of calmness, in fact, she seemed in full control of her senses, he asked that she come with him to point out, the best she could in the dark, the exact spot of the crime. The site she located by memory, near where two rural roads converged, was a most desolated spot where the river pushed by in the dark on one side. On the other, a field of wild flocks trembled in the wind. It was not a spot a young woman with three children should have stopped her car to speak to a stranger. When Diane returned to the hospital, she was given the terrible news about her middle child, Cheryl, as well as the status of her other two children. She took the news gracefully, but her attitude stunned the hospital personnel who had expected her to turn hysterical. She seemed too accepting. When told that Danny had a chance of surviving, she replied in an almost perplexed manner, Do you mean the bullet missed his heart? Gee whiz. Detectives who spoke with her in a private room at Mackenzie Willamette were equally surprised at her attitude. One investigator, a sharp, keen-witted veteran of the county's homicide squad who was aptly named Dick Tracy, found her very rational, considering what she had undergone unlike other women whom he had encountered after similar crises. Together with his partner on the case, Detective Doug Welch, who also found Diane Downs too stoic for a mother whose entire brood was just shot, Tracy conducted an interview to garner some personal background on the mother and her children, as well as to begin building a chronology of events leading up to the shooting. To that point, they had determined that the bullets that had been fired at the kids were twenty-two caliber, shot from either a handgun or rifle. Detectives suspected a handgun. Powder burns on the children's skin indicated that the weapon had been fired at an extremely close proximity, especially those on the deceased girl, Cheryl, who had been in the front seat. Blood splayed across the car's doors, seats, windows, and elsewhere indicated that the murderer had discharged the gun from the left or driver's side, which agreed with Diane's story claiming the intruder had reached in through her window. About the mother herself, the detectives learned that she was 27 years old, was a mailwoman for the U.S. Postal Service, and worked the Cottage Grove Division. Having previously been a letter carrier in Chandler, Arizona, she recently divorced there from a man named Steve Downs, and after obtaining a work transfer, relocated to Oregon to be near her parents, Willa and Wes Fredrickson. The Fredricksons were former Arizonians who had moved to Oregon years earlier. Wes Fredrickson was also a post office employee. Diane sketched for her interviewers a quick history of that evening. According to Diane, she and her children had eaten a fast dinner at home, then left their small duplex home at 1352 Q Street in Springfield, bound for a co-worker's home on rustic Sunderman Road. The friend, Heather Ploward, had told Diane a few days earlier at the workplace that she was thinking about buying a horse, and Diane had found an ad in the newspaper about horse rentals that she figured Heather might appreciate seeing. Not knowing Heather's phone number, they weren't intimate friends. Diane decided to bring the advertisement herself. The drive, she explained, offered a good opportunity to get the kids out of the stale house for a couple of hours. On the way home after a brief chat with Heather and her husband, Diane thought that she would cut through Old Mohawk Road to the main highway. She thought it might be fun to go sightseeing. The kids enjoyed watching the moon from the unlit countryside. It was then, after she turned onto Old Mohawk, that she spotted the man. He was standing in the center of the gravel road, signaling as if for help. She described the man as white, in his late twenties, about five feet nine, a hundred and fifty to a hundred and seventy pounds, dark hair, a shag wavy cut, and a stubble of a beard. He wore a Levi jacket and an off-colored t-shirt. She hit the brakes and got out of her car. 
It was then that the stranger pulled out a pistol from under his jacket and demanded that she turn over the keys to her automobile. She refused, but in retaliation, said Diane, he reached past her through the driver's window and opened fire on her family. When he then tried to reach for the car keys, she fought back, outstepping him. But as she slipped back into her car, he fired one more time, at her now, striking her arm. Slamming the gas pedal, her Nissan sped off and away. Her children were hurt, she could see that, and thought of only one thing, to get them to the hospital as quickly as possible. Tracy's mind had wandered a moment while Diane spoke. He had read the doctor's report on his treatment of Diane's arm injury. A single bullet entered her left forearm. It split in two as it shattered the radius and then exited, leaving two smaller wounds. As she related her getaway from the man on the road and how the bullet struck her arm, he couldn't help thinking that the place where she was wounded was the exact same place other killers had shot themselves to make it appear that they were attacked by a phony assailant, but would not pass judgment until the evidence was in. And that would not be for some time. Before the interview ended, Diane agreed to sign a search warrant on her home. She admitted she owned a 38 caliber pistol, which she kept for protection on her delivery route, and a 22 caliber rifle for home safety, but both were unused. One lay cold, hidden under rags in her trunk, the other collected dust on a shelf in her home. Meanwhile, police around the hospital were busy. In the driveway, they prepared the red Nissan Pulsar with the Arizona license plates for transporting to the crime lab for further investigation. In the morgue, Sergeant John Peckles photographed the wounds on the dead girl. Behind ER, Detective Ray Poole collected evidentiary bloody clothing removed from all three children. All personnel assigned to this particular homicide knew without a doubt that the weekend ahead would mean little leisure time and a lot of pounding on doors, question asking and rattling of brain cells to figure out this confounding, irritating and heartbreaking mystery because three helpless children had their bodies savagely blown open by a gunner, the policemen didn't mind the overtime one bit. They wanted the killer now. Several nurses and an investigator were bedside when Diane Downs was finally allowed into the intensive care unit to see Christy, one of her two surviving children. The spectators noted that, as she squeezed her daughter's hand, murmuring, I love you. She did so as devoid of warmth as an icicle. Her words were passed through clenched teeth. Paul Alton, the investigator, noticed something else. The child's eyes, peeking from above an oxygen mask, took on the glaze of fear when spotting her mom approaching. I happened to glance at the heart rate monitor and at the pulse when Diane came in, said he. The scope showed Christie's heart was beating 104 times a minute. But when Diane took hold of her, that scope jumped to 147. Friday morning, plainclothesmen checked with the Plards to ensure Diane and her kids had visited them the previous evening as Diane had asserted. Mrs. Ploward confirmed the visitation, as well as the reason for it, to give her an ad about horses. Under the supervision of Tracy and Kurt Welch, state troopers searched Diane's Springfield residence, requisitioning several items, including a diary that they found, the aforementioned rifle, a Glenfield 22 caliber located where Diane had said, and a box of standard 22 caliber shells, same as those taken from the children's bodies. One particular item, however, interested Dick Tracy. A photo of a young man in a beard that shared space atop the television with other pictures of Diane. Tracy was cognizant of the fact that Diane had made a phone call to a man in Arizona, a former boyfriend, supposedly, not long after arriving at the hospital. Before she knew the state of her children, before alerting her ex-husband and the father of the children, she acted as if compelled to call this Arizona man. Tracy, studying the photo of the man, wondered if he was looking at the object of Diane's urgent phone call. Fred Hughey of the district attorney's staff sensed something foul almost immediately after being assigned by County DA Pat Horton to prosecute the case. In preparation for what the DA knew would eventually lead to a murder trial, it was Hughie's job to follow the revelations of the case as they surfaced from the origin. As far as Hughie quickly ascertained, the fetus of something evil had taken form in the embryonic blackness of that rural roadway in Lane County. Whatever happened Thursday night, the facts began to come to light in a most suspicious manner. Unlike those explained by the mother, Diane Downs, Hughie, 
relatively new to the DA's investigative squad, nevertheless knew mischief when he saw it, and he saw it first in the faces of two perplexed, scared youngsters strapped to tubes and cords for life in a lowly lit hospital room. Never one for sentiment. Even he was surprised when he felt tears rolling down his cheeks as he gazed upon Christie and Danny Downs. And when he heard from Paul Alton the reaction of Christie when she had seen her mother for the first time since the shooting, he knew it was not the normal reaction of any child who, in pain and surrounded by foreign faces, would have been overjoyed to see the one person in their life to rekindle their spirits. Hugi ordered a round-the-clock guard on the children. He also commissioned a child psychologist to remain at Christie's side during the day, to build up a trust that the child may, when more hail, confide in her about the events on Mohawk Road. Doubt in the mother's story was building. Over the coming days, her version of what happened that night changed slightly. Her placement of the killer when he fired the gun altered in several retellings as did her own actions in the face of the supposed gunman. When Doug Welch interviewed Steve Downs, Diane's ex-husband in Arizona, Welch learned that Diane owned three, not two, weapons, and one was a 22 caliber handgun, which Diane did not mention. Welch found Steve Downs an open, erstwhile talker who seemed glad to be rid of his ex-wife, who, he said, liked to bed hop. An electrical contractor living in Chandler, Arizona, he carried no grudge and seemed to be happy just to live his current bachelor life. He admitted that he and Diane were still friends, but that their occasional phone conversations never extended beyond the kids' health and scholastic welfare. He seemed genuinely upset with the bad news and sincerely fatherly hopeful that Christy and Danny would pull through. He made immediate plans to fly to Oregon to see them. Welch asked Steve Downs if he knew who the Arizona man might be, and the former spouse, not surprised by the question, replied that he must mean the married guy with whom Diane had been having a torrid affair for some time before leaving Arizona. He was a postal worker in Chandler, and whatever happened in their love life, the tryst finally severed. The man returned to his understanding wife, but Diane still seemed to carry the torch, hot and heavy. Her infatuation with this married man was maniacal, it seemed, but he didn't seem the type to leave a doting wife for a woman with three growing, hungry kids. When Welch asked about weapons the couple had owned, and which ones Diane had taken with her to Oregon, Down told him that Diane had a twenty-two rifle, a thirty-eight revolver, and a twenty-two Ruger Mark IV nine-shot semi-automatic pistol. She used to practice her shooting at the local Chandler area range. Why she carried guns? She was a woman and felt she needed protection on her route, Steve Downs suggested. Then Detective Welch felt he had to ask the obvious. Steve, would your ex-wife harm your kids in order to get the married guy back? No way. The other shook his head. She loves those kids. When questioned afterward, Diane denied she still owned the twenty-two caliber. No one in the DA's office, especially Fred Hughey, believed that there had been an aggressor on Old Mohawk Road. Since the beginning of time, wrongdoers have used mythical abductors and thugs as alibis to cover their own or a close friend's crime. In law enforcement jargon, these make-believe violators are niched under the all-encompassing term bushy-haired stranger, the guy who isn't there. The man the defendant claims is really responsible. Of course, the bushy-haired stranger can never be produced in court. Hughie had side-mouthed, We estimate that if the bushy-haired stranger is ever caught, the prison doors will have to be opened to let out all the wrongly convicted defendants. Paul Alton, Hughie's central fact-finder, summed up his and the investigator's misgivings. I don't buy it. She goes out to Sunderman to see Heather Ploward. She decides to go sightseeing and heads toward Marcola. Suddenly, she decides she'll veer off on the old Mohawk Road. Say we buy the story that she's sightseeing. Even if it's almost pitch dark, she's sightseeing. How do we explain that the shooter knew she was going to be there? If he's following her in his own car, he could trail her onto old Mohawk. But she tells us that the stranger is in front of her, standing in the road, waving her down. How does he get there? To the trained Hawkshaw's eyes, the picture was incorrect, incomplete, even retouched. If the killer wanted the car, wouldn't he have shot Diane first? She was the adult and would have been his biggest obstacle, not the three tiny kids huddling in the car. What would a bushy-haired stranger have to gain in shooting Christy Sherrill and Danny Downs? 
Over the weekend, forensic scientist James Pex from the Oregon State Police Department examined the interior of the Downs automobile to produce some thoughtful findings. As reported to Hughie and his squad, Pex had found a couple of 22 caliber U-shell copper casings ejected after firing. No bullet had penetrated the body of the car, indicating that all bullets had hit their live marks. Blood smeared the side door of the front seat where Cheryl had tumbled after being shot, and pools of blood stained the rear seat where Danny and Christy had been hit. But, Peck surprised, no blood at all on the driver's side, no smears on the steering wheel. If a bullet had hit Diane as she was getting into her car, as she said, it would have been reflex for her to grab that wound with her idle hand. There would have been blood on that hand then, as she tried to steer the car from the scene, blood on the steering wheel. Also, when a bullet is fired, he explained, the barrel discharges a small amount of smokeless gunpowder forward towards the target. Such powder particles were detected in three angles of the car on the right panel and in a sweep along the back seat. There were no particles, however, on the driver's panel. What did all this mean? It could very well mean that whoever did the shooting had been seated in the driver's seat, and that Diane Downs shot herself just before she reached the hospital. A scouring of the entire crime area had failed to produce the murder weapon, but ejected casings from a spent 22 caliber, matching those in the car, were discovered in the vicinity. Divers even plunged into the Mohawk River, which runs through the topography, but could not find the gun. Unfortunately, the river churned here and ran a rapid course that time of year in the spring, and experts determined that had the gun been tossed into the waters, it would have been flushed away miles on the river's current. Hughie, who figured the courts hadn't much of a case against Diane Downs without the murder weapon, even went to look for the gun himself. He waded along the river, turned over loose stones, kicked through the reed grass, and scuffed the toe of his shoe through the ditch alongside the road to upturn loose soil, but nothing. To sink his spirits further, he learned that Christy Downs had suffered a stroke, a direct symptom of the gunshot wound. Her speech was distorted and the physicians told him she may never speak again. The left side of the brain, the side that controlled the ability to speak, had been injured, but there was hope, albeit slight. Doctors prayed that because she was so young, they could reverse the deterioration with therapy and restore her slurring tongue. There was no gun to condemn Diane, and perhaps the only live witness to the murder, the murderer's own daughter, would be unable to accuse her mother. But Hugh G. more than ever believed that Diane was guilty, when he was shown the diary and the letters confiscated from her home. They both reeked of a longing for the Arizona man, her lost love, a man who by the tone of the pages had deserted her. The cause of his desertion may have been, and the diary hinted this, that his wife had simply stepped in to put the clamps down. One passage caught Hughie's attention. It was dated April 21st, less than a month before the crime on Mohawk Road. Like so many entries, it was written in the form of a letter addressed to someone else, but used as a meter to weigh her own thoughts on such a thing. This passage, like most of the others, was addressed to her former lover and read, What happened? I'm so confused. What could she have said or done to make you act this way? I spoke to you this morning for the last time. It broke my heart to hear you say, Don't call or write. I still think of you as my best friend and my only lover, and you keep telling me to go away and find somebody else. You have got to be kidding. Hugh resolved to get to the bottom of this business. He kept asking himself, who is he, and is he involved in any way in the murder scheme? He doubted it, yet he could not get over the feeling that her obsession with this ex-boyfriend had driven her to lift that gun against her own children. They were obstacles in the path of singly obtaining him. And if he was correct in his guesswork, would the man's wife be Diane's next victim? Diane's letters were visions of fantasies. They spoke of masturbation engendered by thoughts of her one true lover. In one letter, between references to sexual self-pleasure, she rhymes, I love you more than could your wife, yet it's brought sorrow to my life. I just keep hoping and hanging on. How much longer can I be strong? Perhaps she could be strong no longer, Hughie wondered. Before the weekend ended, he dispatched two of his investigators to Chandler, Arizona, to find out who this man of her wet dreams really was. The week of May 23rd was a sad one, yet it brought optimism. 
Cheryl Downs's funeral took place on the 25th to much bereavement from family, intimate friends, and the Springfield community. But yet good news came from Mackenzie Willamette Hospital. Both Christy and Danny were out of danger. One of Christy's arms was paralyzed, and her speech was garbled for now, albeit doctors believed capable of being revitalized. Danny would probably be crippled for the rest of his life, but his brain had not been affected, and he would live. Both kids had been lucky. Totally against the odds, lucky. Doug Welch and Paul Alton were dispatched to Arizona to use their professional experience to dig up Diane Downs's past and anyone, including Lou Lewiston, who came along with the shovel work. Their trip during the last weeks of May proved fruitful. They learned just what they wanted to know about their central suspect, Miss Diane Downs. One of the first things they accomplished was proving that neither Steve Downs nor the mysterious Lou were Diane's bushy-haired stranger. Witnesses verified seeing them or being in their company in Arizona at the precise hour of the crime. The detectives also spoke with several of Diane's former co-workers from the Chandler Branch Post Office. Their opinions of her varied. Some, it was clear, didn't like her at all. No one praised her. Some of the informants describe a woman with a single-mindedness, a channeling of ambition that they had rarely, if ever, encountered. Others disagreed. Diane Downs had been flippy-dippy, up and down, mad and sad. A few witnesses spoke on her behalf, and then only with faint praise. What emerged after the postal interviews was a postcard picture that might have been beautiful had its colors not run together. She appeared to be a headstrong woman, but headstrong in a tilted way. Her priorities were overblown and most of all out of sync. She jumped in the sack with men right and left, but refused to deliver copies of Playboy to customers on her route. Lou Lewiston worked at the Chandler station too, but the investigators interviewed him separately at his home. To his credit, they liked him. They liked his honesty and directness. He insisted that his wife, Nora, be there at his side, while he candidly discussed even his sexual experiences with his old flame. Nora, he said, knew the history and had forgiven him. The couple had reconciled, and Lou Lewiston wanted nothing more to do with Diane Downs. While the memory of his extramarital affair was undoubtedly painful to him, he answered the detective's questions cordially and succinctly. He had met Diane at work in late 1981 after her divorce from Steve Downs. Lou was magnetized by the female's sexy gestures and her revealing clothing. Loving his wife Nora, Lou was nonetheless taken with this new girl at the mail bin, who blared easy virtue in loose midriff and sans bra. Their friendship evolved overnight into a string of sleazy hotel room encounters. Lou admittedly expected the affair to end swiftly. As had all her relationships, none of them had lasted with other men he knew she had gone with. But as the months rolled on, he found that she was not intending to let go. In fact, she was pulling tight on his private time and urging him to divorce Nora as soon as possible. Suddenly, it dawned on him he was up and over in a relationship he never intended to move from off the bedsprings. He tried to break their seeing each other, but each time Diane protested violently. The affair continued and continued, Lou said, and I was with Diane all day at work, and I'd be with her all night long, and it was every day for months. I basically didn't have time to think, you know. I was with Diane all the time. Welch and Alton then noted something that Lewiston added that hit a high note because it complemented what their boss, Fred Hughey, had been contemplating all along. That the Downs children may have gotten in the way of their mother's love life. Despite her pleas, he refused to see her when she was with Danny, Christie, and Cheryl. I wouldn't be with her if the children were around, he explained. It was an affair. It didn't seem right. After battling guilt for many months, Lou decided to say adios to Diane. The girlfriend's remonstrations had been incessant, and one night in February 1983, Lou severed them. Diane asked me who I loved the most, her or Nora. I said I loved Nora. She blew up. She ranted and raved and screamed at me. I'd never seen anyone act that way before. When Lou raced home, Diane followed him, even up the steps of his own home with Nora present. She pounded on our door all night long, Lou's wife recalled. Then she called on the phone. But she reappeared the following day, confronting Nora on the stoop. She began to tell me what I should do about my marriage, my relationship with Lou, everything. I slammed the door in her face. It had been what Lou called the final straw, and he never saw her again. Not long after that chaotic night, 
Diane put in a transfer to Oregon. She relocated to Springfield to be near her parents. But the letters and the phone calls to Lou continued. One thing more. The lawman asked Lou if he had any knowledge about guns that Diane might have owned. He did. One of them, he said, was a 22 caliber handgun. But Diane continued to deny she owned it. Diane Downs was born on August 7, 1955, in Phoenix, Arizona. Her parents, Willa Dean and Wes Fredrickson, named her Elizabeth Diane. As the years passed, she trimmed her name to simply Diane. Having wed as teens and still in their teens when Diane came along, the parents were awed at their having a human life to maintain. And while they loved their baby, they fell short in their ability to emanate a warm fondness a child inherently expects. As a school student, Diane was bright but not one of the in crowd. Disciplining old-time Baptist parents forbade trendy clothing and fads, resulting in their daughter being considered a washout. Wherever she went, she was the square, the ugly duckling. Diane's father allegedly molested her when she was 11 years old. Diane told authorities that the occurrences never led to fornication. On weekends, Diane claimed that he took her on rides to the desert. Once away from civilization, he would make her remove her blouse and bra as he watched. Diane said that these perversions ended as quietly as they had begun, and Wes Fredrickson became more of a typical father as if cessation would eradicate all memories. He allowed her to enroll in a charm school when she was 14. And that was the beginning of a new Diane, one who, with her hair cut stylishly and her garb up to date, the local boys began to notice. Diane, hungry for love by this time, responded by being the babe with flashy eyes, swaying hips, and silly come-hither giggle. Stephen Downs, one of the boys at Moon Valley High, fell instantly in love with the pretty and now suddenly shapely blonde Diane. The pair became an item and roved together everywhere they went, arm linked in arm. After graduation, they parted for a spell. He to the Navy, she to Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. They corresponded regularly. But if Diane had promised to save it for Steve, she would have weakened, for she was expelled from the religious school after a year for promiscuity. Steve returned home and the couple wed on November 13, 1973. From the starting gun, the marriage was, at best, shaky. Steve worked half the time and Diane found her high school sweetheart less a noble escape and more of a repetition of her domineering papa. She had wanted love and realized too late that Steve was not that love. She found solace when she became pregnant. Carrying a baby made her feel for the first time that she was actually in charge of a love that was all dependent on her. It was a feeling of power she'd never before realized, and she relished in the delight that she was the helmswoman of her own path to total love. But after Christy was born in October 1974, it was back to serving Steve as meals. Never mind that she had a baby to care for and worked part-time at a local thrift store too. To keep from falling apart emotionally, she needed to feel that emotion once again of the seed of love stirring inside her. She again became pregnant. Cheryl Lynn followed her older sister into this world in January 1976. Throughout 1976 and 1977, Diane took the kids and ran away from Steve several times. But she always came back. Steve would hunt her down to one of her many relatives' homes. But once reunited, it was monkey-chasing weasel time all over again. He was unhappy and she was unhappy, but the marriage waned on. Diane waited for something to happen. Hostile but passive, she was both bored and angry. Life was passing quickly by her. None of the things she promised herself had come true. She decided again to conceive but not Steve's baby. By that time, 1978, the family had moved to Mesa, where both Diane and Steve worked for the same mobile home manufacturer. On the assembly line, Diane found her stud, whom she passionately seduced. Her tummy swelled again and she floated in Wonderland, drugged on love. Danny was born four days after Christmas, 1979. Even though the child was not his, Steve accepted the boy as his own. Still, the marriage had reached its ebb, and within a year, the Downs decided to divorce. Diane moved in with Danny's father, and it was during this time she began to change. Now. Out of the wifely manacles imposed by society and the Baptists, she seemed to ignore her duties as a mother also. The opiate of her children's love had worn off. She preferred to work 
to stay away from home, to throw the youngsters on any babysitter she could find. One sitter relates an incident that, even though she didn't know it at the time, foreshadowed tragedy. Diane put everything before those kids. If Danny wanted attention, she would push him away. But the worst thing was one time I caught Cheryl jumping on the bed, and I said that was not permitted. I made her sit in a chair and think about it. Cheryl sat quietly for a while, and then she looked up. Do you have a gun here? Of course not. Why? I want to shoot myself. My mom says I'm bad. Diane finally found a full-time position with the U.S. Post Office in 1981 and was stationed in Chandler. It was there she met Lou Lewiston and fell in love. But for once, it was the other party, not Diane, to make the decision when and where the love affair would end. As she had done mentally to her own kids, Lou physically walked out of her life. Caught unawares, she ran home to Oregon, but not quite understanding, nor acceptant of the fact, that this time she didn't have it her way. In June, Assistant DA Fred Hugie met with his investigative squad to review its findings. Whether or not to arrest Diane Downs was the issue unsettled. He wanted to see her taken in, but not at the expense of the county office, which would take extreme heat were the case thrown out in pre-trial. Nevertheless, Hugie and his men were convinced she was guilty, but they feared that without the presence of a murder weapon or a viable witness who literally saw her do the shooting, much of what they had gathered to date would be, in all fairness, considered circumstantial evidence and unacceptable in an American courtroom, not enough to convict. The team examined what they had collected so far. Among the evidence was a small number of twenty-two caliber bullet casings found on Old Mohawk Road, a very graphic display of carnage in Diane's red Nissan Pulsar, the estimation of the bullet's paths from an accepted authority, a diary that screamed Diane's obsession for ex-lover. Her letters colored with pornographic daydreams and testimony from two men, Steve Downs and the former lover, who swore she indeed owned something she continued to disclaim, a 22 caliber handgun. The most expressive piece of evidence came from the pen of forensic expert Jim Pex, who wrote that it was his estimation that some of the unfired 22 caliber shells found in Diane's home had once been worked through the mechanism of the same gun that shot the children, but until the very gun was retrieved, Hughie knew the court could refute it. Investigators had also been able to shed doubt on Diane's story that she immediately raced for the hospital after the attack on her kids. According to the testimony of hospital personnel, she arrived outside the ER that fateful night at around 10.48 p.m., screaming, Somebody just shot my kids! The estimated time she had left the Plord's home was, according to Heather Plord herself, 9.45 p.m., the detectives knew that the shooting then must have occurred at approximately 10.15 in order to give Diane enough time to regather her senses, survey the condition of her kids, then drive, as she had claimed, immediately to Mackenzie Willamette Hospital to reach it by 10.48 p.m. But in the meantime, a witness had come forward, explaining that he had seen what he was sure was Diane's red Nissan, near 10.20 p.m., moving very slowly, five to seven miles an hour, along Old Mohawk Road. The car, said witness Joseph Inman, wasn't being driven critically. Another telling tale, but so far, just a tale. But the legal wheels behind Hughie believed also that Diane was guilty, and the DA maneuvered the wheels to spin to show his support for the long hours his assistant was dedicating to catch a child killer. In Lane County, a grand jury assembled behind closed doors. The panelists wanted to hear directly from those main players that list of testifiers that Hughie had given the DA. Among them, her former lover, Mr. Inman, Heather Plord, Jim Pex, and others, and eventually Diane Downs herself. Other positive things were happening. County Judge Gregory Foote placed the two surviving Downs youngsters in the protective custody of the state's Child Services Bureau. This meant that in the meantime, Diane was not allowed to see her kids. That she felt she was being treated like a criminal was, in reality, a nose-thumb by Hughie after she violently threatened to remove the children from the hospital and take them away, if detectives wouldn't stop hounding her. Danny, still confined to his bed, was given full protection by the police department until he would be medically released, at which time he would follow his sibling into a suitable foster family. The home where Christy was transported was kept a secret, her whereabouts known by only a few authorities. 
in the middle of the grand jury summons process and the ongoing search for more evidence, particularly the vanished gun, the sheriff's office announced layoffs. State funds dropped and Paul Alton was laid off. Doug Welch and another of Hughie's top men, Kurt West, were given a month's notice. All of Hughie's investigators, in fact, were let go or redeployed. Throughout the coming winter and into the spring of 1984, Diane was fast becoming the media's favorite star. Newshounds had picked up on her plight. Some medium distrusted her, but to most she was a bouncy maiden, maybe not in distress, but picked on by mean old Uncle Sam who couldn't find the bushy-haired beast of mythology. Because she looked a little like Princess Diana, she became the darling fashion plate of the American Pacific Coast. Less trivial papers called her Princess Di, but Hughie saw her as anything but a princess, a good or a bad one. She was more like the Wicked Witch, creating havoc at every point in life. Her kids had been swept from her custody. She was indignant and sought revenge. She balked to the press that she was misunderstood and was a victim of prejudice and harassment. Ignoring her bravado, Hughie let her talk, refusing to back down. For that matter, he endeavored to bite her every footstep. And that is why he chose to let investigators Welch and West turn up the heat before they surrendered to the layoff. They dogged her. Finally, Diane Downs called for what she hoped would turn into a peace treaty, a meeting with the two detectives to explain her side of the story and pass on further information she had not divulged since the night of the attack on Old Mohawk Road. At first, the detectives bought it, hoping this new revelation might produce something startlingly new. But sensing they were being conned, the session led to what would become known as the hardball interview. At the parley, Diane explained that she believed the killer was someone she might have known. He had called her by name. If true, this information would have made a great impact on the entire case. But to the two men gathered in their office with her, it was a clear charade, an attempt to delay the proceedings she felt moving against her, and possibly even throw the investigators off her trail altogether. Insulted, her listeners turned the table and fell upon Diane verbally with such an interrogation that she was left the deceived instead of the deceiver. Why was she telling them this now? She didn't know. How did he know what road she was going to take home from Heather's? She didn't know. Was he a friend from Oregon or Arizona? She didn't know. What purpose would he have to kill her kids? She didn't know. Did she really rush to the hospital immediately after the kids were shot? Or did she pause a while? She didn't know. Why didn't she try to stop the gunman when he began blasting away at the kids in the Nissan? She didn't know the answer to that either. And when they asked her point blank if she tried to kill her kids because they ruined her chances with her lover, well, she had an answer to that. She called them names, threatened them, and told them they were all fed up and stormed out. Whether or not it was a ploy for sympathy, just in case she needed some in the event of a jury trial, or whether she merely needed to feel that love once again within her, she went out and got pregnant, once again from one of her favorite studs. She made sure to explain the symbolic meaning of her action to a TV reporter. I got pregnant because I miss Christy, and I miss Danny, and I miss Cheryl so much. You can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they give me satisfaction, they give me stability, they give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy. And a reason to perhaps escape death row. Yugi sneered, watching her performance on the tube. Paula Krogdahl, the counselor put in charge of mentally raising Christy from her nightmares, was making excellent progress in the meantime. The child began to talk, to remember, to face reality. While Krogdahl tiptoed through her treatment, avoiding the murder scenario for a long time, she got Christy to speak about her family life and her mother. Christy admitted that Diane had hit her and her brother and sister a lot, and when the day came, the therapist asked her to recall what happened the night of what Christy called that terrible thing. Was there anyone there that night that you didn't know? asked Krogdahl, referring to the stranger on the dark road. No, the girl answered. Were Danny and Cheryl crying? No. Why wasn't Cheryl crying? Dead. A pause, then softly. Do you know who was shooting Christy? I think. But Christy could not muster the words. Crodal didn't push and let it go, for now. Hughie decided to bite the bullet. Experts told him that he had enough evidence, and they believed he had a strong case, 
but he would need to have to recreate that terrible thing in court, piece all the puzzle fragments together in such a way, so that the panel of jurors saw what he saw and totally believed. The grand jury was wrapping up after nine months of interviews. They had spoken to, quizzed, and deliberated on the words of many, including Diane Downs, and balanced at the end of those nine months the tomes of testimony they possessed. They handed down an indictment, one charge of murder, two charges of attempted murder, and two charges of criminal assault. The state of Oregon was going for the child killer's throat. On February 28, 1984, police cuffed Diane as she was alighting from her car in the parking lot of the post office. District Attorney Pat Horton, along with Lane County Sheriff David Burks, hosted a press conference following Diane's arrest. Horton told the press, The one thing that underscored this investigation is patience. The real battle is in the courtroom. Reporters were there by the droves, salivating over the battle indeed to come. Their newspapers and their magazines already announced that Diane Downs had been taken into custody and that, hell, the look-alike Princess Di might very well be a murderess after all. Time magazine was there, the Washington Post was there, and journalists from city papers as far away as New York City were there. Most were professional in their reporting, while some, tabloid-like, tumbled across both Springfield, Oregon and Chandler, Arizona, finding anyone who knew Diane Downs or even talked to her once. When the Eugene Register Guard found Diane's father, Wes Fredrickson, the paper noted he was gallant to the end. If my daughter did it, then I believe, in fact, she should pay. But nothing can take away the love a father has for his kids. In the wake of the impending trial, Diane sought as her counselor the brilliant and highly esteemed attorney Melvin Belly. Because of the high profile the Downs case generated, Belly wanted to take it on. But he had personal plans, unbreakable, and would defend Diane only if the trial could be postponed a couple of months after the already slated May 1984 calendar. The courts refused to budge. Hughie had waited long enough and delaying it might mean delaying it again for the pregnant Diane to give birth. Too much work had been expended. Too many people's time to delay the inevitable. Fred Hughie had 24 volumes of evidence, statements, follow-ups, and transcriptions of tapes. A mountain of possibilities to be winnowed down, shaped, and molded for his case. He would work 18 to 24 hour days, and so would the rest of his team. Diane was forced to find another lawyer quickly. She chose criminal attorney Jim Jagger, a man noted for his down-home but effective manner. What was to be a six-week trial opened May 10, 1984, in Eugene at the Lane County Courthouse, courtroom number three, the largest of the rooms of justice in the old building. The jury panel consisted of nine women. Judge Foote, the man who had taken Christy and Danny Downs from their suspect mother, presided. Young and intense, he was noted for his fairness. The citizenry of the county turned out for the sensation. People across America were still divided over the guilt or innocence of Diane Downs. Was she a martyr or a devil? And those no names who shared the spectator's seats with the paparazzi, the witnesses and the families felt honored. In his opening remarks, Fred Hughie presented a motive for her fixation on a married man who felt that her kids should not be part of their fantasy life and a method the 22 caliber Ruger pistol that she bought in Arizona and denied having owned in Oregon. He read passages from her diary, screaming her love for a man who didn't want her as she wanted him. And to some titillation of the court, he read aloud Diane's masturbation poem. He promised to paint over the next weeks a real picture of the cruelty that made Diane Downs tick. Counsel for the defense conceded, in turn, that there had been an obsession but not so dark as to have led his client to destroy the three people she loved most in the world. He pointed to her childhood, to her alleged molestation as a child, even to her promiscuity that he saw as a relevance to that dysfunctional experience. But a murderess? No, for he intended to show that Diane's story of a man on the Mohawk Road with a gun was not a falsehood. Courtroom proceedings paused on May 14th, so that the jurors could experience for themselves the physical scene of the crime. Hughie transported them via a chartered bus to Old Mohawk Road, parallel to the river. Through daylight, the prosecutor accentuated the state of the road at the time of the shootings, relating the ebony of that night, the loneliness, the sparks of gunfire that shattered the gloom, and the high emotion. 
Before the day ended, jurors were then led to the county auto pound to see the red Nissan death car. He wanted them to gaze into its interior and to feel the kid's terror. Back in court during the week, the first of the state's witnesses were brought forth. They comprised mostly personnel from Mackenzie Willamette Hospital, where Cheryl Downs died, and where doctors struggled to save the other two Downs children. Nurse Rose Martin recalled Mother Diane's peculiar attitude toward what had just happened. She asked how the children were, and I told her the doctors were in there working on them, Martin remembered. And then she, the mother, laughed, and she said, Only the best for my kids. And she laughed again and said, Well, I have good insurance. Dr. John Mackey, who was in charge of the ER the evening of the murder, described the children's chest wounds and the medical team's first spontaneous efforts of life-saving. He then recollected his observation of Diane. She was extremely composed. She was unbelievably composed. I couldn't believe she was a family member. There were no tears, no disbelief. No, why did this happen to me? X-ray technician Carlene Elbridge could not get over the fact that Diane, a mother of three, severely wounded youngsters, and then complained about having to be seen in public without makeup. Throughout the trial, witnesses came and went, each making an impact, some more than others. But the high point, the turning point, the riveting point came when Christy Downs was brought to the stand. Quivering, tear-streaked, she was ushered to the stand by Fred Hugie. It was clear that he detested the moment, to bring a child face-on against her mother, but the moment was needed if American justice was to be played out. Hugie, pale, jaw tight, but with a fatherly voice, led the examination of little Christy Downs. From time to time he handed her Kleenex while she paused to wipe her cheeks. He waited until she regained herself whenever she broke down. Usually after her eyes and her mother's momentarily met, he didn't rush her and he remained gentle. When she spoke and her voice might be muffled under her sobs, he clarified the question so that the jurors would completely understand the tintinabulation of that tiny voice. He loved this little child. It was obvious in the way he looked at her and spoke to her. The courtroom inhaled and didn't seem to exhale until it was over. And then, especially then, breath came short. Hughie began by explaining to the girl the importance of telling the truth on the stand. She understood. Giving her time to relax, and her voice to become sufficiently audible to the courtroom, he then asked her several routine questions about her family, her schooling, and herself. Feeling that she was ready for the heavy stuff, he maneuvered into the day of the crime, her visit with her family to Heather Plourd's home on Sunderman Road in order to give Mrs. Plard the clipping from the newspaper about horse rentals. Christy was visibly shaken. Hughie patted her shoulder and gave her a reassuring smile. He gave her a moment to recover before proceeding. Reassuring that she was okay, he resumed his line of questioning about what Diane did with her children. She leaned over to the back seat and shot Danny, Christy said. What happened then? Hughie prompted her. What happened after Danny got shot? The child caved in under her tears, and Hughie hugged her. Knowing this must come and wanting to get it over with, he gave her time to find her voice once again. Then quietly, sympathetically, he went on. He gingerly rephrased his question, for by this time the court had already gathered what Diane Downs did after she shot Danny. Do you remember when you got shot? Hughie asked her. Yeah, she answered. Who shot you? My mom, she simply said. After that pathetic moment, the tone for the rest of the trial was set. Everything else, all other words, were anticlimactic. Diane Downs was as guilty as sin. Outside the walls of the courtroom, too, Americans who had refused to believe that a mother could consciously pull a trigger on three harmless children, surrendered. She had been vilified, justly, and the cross that they thought was being nailed together to crucify a martyr became suddenly an instrument of deserved justice. On June 14, 1984, Judge Foote read aloud the jury's unanimous verdict, guilty of attempted murder in the first degree, guilty of a second account of attempted murder in the first degree, guilty of first degree assault, guilty of another count of first degree assault, guilty of murder. Oregon at the time did not impose the death sentence, but in the subsequent sentencing, the judge sought to deprive Diane Downs of the daylight of liberty forevermore.
After decreeing a life term, plus an additional 50 years for using a firearm, he expressed, The court hopes the defendant will never again be free. I've come as close to that as possible. Between the verdict and the sentencing, the court recessed while Diane gave birth to a beautiful child, whom she named Amy. The father of the baby denied her, and in time, a caring family adopted Amy. In 1987, Diane briefly escaped from the Oregon Women's Correctional Center, where she had been incarcerated. After her recapture, she was transported to the High Maximum Clinton Correctional Institution in New Jersey. Today, she sits in the Valley Prison for Women in Chowchilla, California. Diane's former lover and his wife remained happily married. Steve Downs was still living in Oregon. The children, Christy and Danny, survived the ordeal. Danny was confined to a wheelchair, but was a happy boy. Christy has grown into a very content teenager. Both consider the ending of their story to be happy ever after. In 1986, they moved into the home of their new loving adoptive parents, Fred and Joanne Huji. Hey there, amazing true crime enthusiasts. I've got some thrilling news to share with all of you. If you've been following my YouTube channel, you already know we've been delving deep into the world of true crime mysteries together. It's been an incredible journey and I'm so grateful for your support. But guess what? We're taking things to the next level. I'm excited to announce that I've just launched a brand new podcast on Spotify where you can enjoy the audio versions of all your favorite YouTube videos, minus the intros, outros, and ads. It's like getting to the heart of the true crime stories you love delivered straight to your ears. The podcast is on Spotify right now, so hit that follow button to make sure you never miss an episode. This podcast is all about bringing you the core content of our true crime investigations in a convenient audio format. So whether you're on your daily commute, going for a run, or just chilling at home, you can now immerse yourself in these captivating stories without any distractions. If you have any cases you'd like me to cover, or if you just want to chat about true crime, feel free to drop me a message on social media, or leave a comment. Your input and engagement mean the world to me. Thank you for being such an amazing community and for joining me on this journey. I'm thrilled to make these stories more accessible to you through our new podcast on Spotify. So grab your headphones and hit that follow button. Stay curious, my friends. Talk to you soon. And as always, stay safe and take care.